I, I really can't think of anyone who hasn't in some form or fashion heard about the problems that are going on in the Darfur region. The question is, do we really know what that's all about? And I, I'm joined today by two people who are going to be able to tell us firsthand what this is all about. So we won't be able to say that we did not know what's going on. Uh, Bob and Paulette Cooper, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's Glad good to be, here. to be here. The two of you have actually, this is something most Westerners can't say, you've actually been to Darfur. Yes, we left on March the 12th and returned on March the 30th this year. Now t tell me, what, what were you doing? I, I can think of plenty of places that I'd like to go, uh, but that's not necessarily the safest place in the world. I well, uh, a review of what, kind of how we got okay. there has to do with the history of the conflict, which last Saturday was the fifth anniversary of the suffering that started in Darfur, which is in western Sudan. For those who don't know, it's in the southern part, of just south of Egypt. It's the largest country in Africa. And they've suffered to the tune of about 400, three to 400,000 killed. That number is being debated. Uh, there are two million people, that we, many of whom we met, that are homeless, living in basically sticks with plastic over the top. And then you have the villagers who retain that have tried to hang on to their lives, and that's where we spent most of our time while we were in Darfur. Now, what were you doing there? Uh, we started off supporting large uh, nonprofit organizations, the, the so-called uh, humanitarian relief organizations, Red Cross and so forth, and we decided to focus that down to just work on the suffering. We've even worked on the political side. And so we decided to work on water, thinking that water, I'll let Paula explain mm -hmm. what, uh, what we did there. You worked on water? We did. We uh, went into the very small villages and we helped repair some water um, pumps. Um, the guy who <clears throat> we worked with actually has over 100 requests from village sheikhs to come into their villages and repair the pumps and the wells. And once they're repaired, they figure that one pump, one fixed pump, can serve up to as many as 1,500 people. And so you're doing some very valuable work there. Well, ask, ask one of those 1,500 people. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, it's, it's that old story of can one person make a difference? Yeah. And I'm here to tell you absolutely one person can make a difference, mm -hmm. a huge difference. One person can help fix one well and 1,500 people mm. maximum get water. And so now tell incredible. me, who, so, so who's doing the fighting then? Oh, and the, the conflict, as we said, started some time ago. There is a proxy militia. Uh, the government of Sudan really doesn't uh, say that they support them, although there are claims uh, by many people on the ground, reporters and so forth, uh, that started. The, pe the conflict is essentially one of the people feeling in West Darfur that they're not part of the national growth, which is double-digit GNP growth. Uh, and they haven't shared in that, and in 2004, 2003, they took a militia, a small group of rebels, and attacked a group in El Fasher near where we were. And since that time, they've unleashed this horror against all the people, pretty much in the Darfur region, which is about the size of Texas, by the way. Many people don't realize how, how large Darfur is. Are they trying to get them to move out of the area? I mean, is, this, is that what the, the attempt is, to get the people? To suppress the people. They can't stand another revolt. They just signed an agreement with uh, the southern part of Sudan in 2005, negotiated in part by our own government and they were never part of that agreement and felt that they should have been. They were left out, in other words. And from that started this conflict, and it's just the overwhelming horror of it all that attracted us to say, in the Holocaust, we were too young. In Rwanda, I was too busy working and taking kids, to putting them through college. And with this claim of genocide, we could not say to ourselves and our future generations, never again, you know, it's never going to happen again. And so we became involved directly to see what we could do, even if it's on a smaller scale. Now, so the, so the two of you, that is how this should be con 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 considered and conceived uh, by the rest of us as uh, a, a true Holocaust that's going on in our day and time. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Because if you listen to the, the Sudanese government, they say, well, there have been about nine, 10,000 people that have been killed. Uh, as you say, the figures uh, that, that are coming out from those who are trying to assist everybody, are up to 400,000 people, maybe even Absolutely. more than 400,000 people. Now, you were there yourselves. Which one sounds closer to the truth to you? Well, what we decided, we're not sure, because we read all the reports and we studied this conflict for almost two years before we left. And we studied the nature of the, the agreements we had between our government and theirs to do intelligence work. They harbored Osama bin Laden for five years. And we felt ourselves so embroiled in that when still nothing was happening by the United Nations and our own government that we just scaled that back to deal with what we call the suffering. And the suffering that we dealt with has created what we consider hope 
for the people where we visited. And it was so positive that uh, we just want to tell that story about how to deal with the suffering and not just embroil ourselves in all the political debate. Well, so, so you, you're telling me, Ms. Cooper, a, a story about how when you're in this kind of, of environment, you really have to dress the part, so to speak. And uh, I, I did. I ran. I, I wore. I, my head was always covered. Uh, it, it's a totally Muslim country where we were. It's 99.9 percent .9 Muslim. So I was made sure that I had on long sleeves and I had on a head covering because you you just do that and long skirts. So I you know didn't want to offend anyone. So I, I dressed the part. And we had a couple of humorous incidents about that, but uh, if you want me to go into that, I'll be happy to. Well, sure. I mean, <laughs> I mean you, you, you told me, for example, and I, don't, I, I think most of us know that in many parts of the world, uh, women cover themselves completely, but I don't know if we realize that the hands, too? Yes. Um, I, had, I, I don't like flies, so I had gotten one of these head covering things from REI that kept the flies off of you. So I had that over my head. So some of the women who hadn't seen this kind of thing before thought I was wearing some sort of a burqa. Well, I also had the long sleeve shirt on and I had the long skirt on, but my hands weren't covered. And if you've got the burqa on, your hands are supposed to be covered. So there was a great deal of chatter <laughs> going back and forth trying to figure out just what on earth kind of a foreign Muslim I was because no one could, no one could place me. So it was kind of interesting to hear the chatter in the background that was all going on. It was translated for us. We had a wonderful driver who was just a miracle worker and got us into places that normally Westerners can never go. And we got in and out in safety. Really? <clears throat> so now, the two of you have told me that the mistake most of us make is that there's just nothing we can do. It, it's just too big a problem for us. You don't believe that? No, we don't. Absolutely not. A explain to me why you think that, or, and <clears throat> what you think we can do. Well, our work is an example of what we felt were the least of the people in the world, the least of the people in the furthest reaches of the world. Basically, it's the cradle of civilization. It's the birthplace of, the, of humanity. And we sat back and we said, if this were Canada or Mexico or if it was in Fort Worth, and we said, well, what, would, what do they really need? So we did a needs assessment with a, a bunch of organizations, and we came to the need of water. And the, the most neediest of people in the world were there. The greatest need was water. So we just focused our energy on this nonprofit organization. I still have the hat here. It's called Thirst No More out of Austin, Texas. And they've been over there for two years. They've committed a family, uh, maybe <coughs> more than one family. Just last week, a second family moved there for 10 years. So it's not a short-term proposition for this family. This is a commitment. Group of families, yes. And they have yeah. two small children, um, 9 and 11. And the kids are there, and they're having the experience of a lifetime because they're in an international mm -hmm. school. They're learning different cultures, and it's just a phenomenal experience for them. But when we were there, I mean, the, just to be able to help one person can do so much. I mean, I'm living proof that one person makes a huge difference because through various contacts here and there along the way, we were able to make contact with a huge, well, not huge, but a very large company in Houston and they were in Sudan at the time and they were leaving. Well, they donated all the stuff they were leaving behind to this organization. That included some vehicles and a truck, all of which can help with the water pump repair. In order to repair a pump, I mean, just one, one section of pipe, which they desperately need, it's, it's only $32. And we're out of pipe. Sometimes we it's, run out of I'm, pipe. So you think you can't make a difference? Oh, yeah, yeah you so, can. So Just one piece of pipe can make a huge difference. So would you suggest that, uh, <clears throat> if, if, for example, people who want to donate, you can donate through organizations like this, Thirst mm -hmm. No More? Yeah, we're going to have it on, if you'll have it, let us oh. have that on the website. Sure. The intersection of three groups, the large oil company, Weatherford International, they said we can use their name, uh, out of Houston. Uh, a man up Athens, Texas, a, a small nonprofit there, built a drilling rig. And he donated this rig. And it's being paid for the shipping by Weatherford. And all of this group called Thirst No More will be the focal point to deploy these assets. Another group has donated, donated two water purification units that are solar powered. And all this has happened just since we've been fortunate enough to see the work that's being done. And we were a little part of that by arranging for the, some of this asset transfers. Water then is the key and yes, we can is. make a difference. Yes. I, I like to say Hope's new name is water. <laughs> <laughs> 
It is. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank we appreciate you both will. of you. Thank, Thank you, John. You. Thank you.